So last time we defined what it means to be a basis of a vector space. And this is, of course, a different point of view than you may have seen in 220 or something like that in a matrix algebra class where you think about the basis first. And you're given a, you define a vector as a list of numbers, a matrix as a, a linear transformation as a matrix of numbers. So the basis is sort of there from the beginning. We're thinking about bases from the other direction. That is, we're giving axioms uh, such that something is a basis. And those axioms can be used to prove that such things you know, are, are a basis. So one of the costs, you know, starting this way is sort of efficient. You can immediately start making computations, but it has some costs. One of the big costs is that when you start thinking about change of bases, um, and it gets a little bit confusing. And when you try to distinguish, you know, what is the difference between a matrix and a linear transformation, that gets even more confusing. Okay, so that's very hard to do if you start things out this way. But the way we're doing it, hopefully, both the, the idea of change of basis won't be mysterious, and the difference between a matrix and a linear transformation should, should always be clear to you. Um, the other reason that it's useful to think about uh, bases in the abstract is that there are lots of cases where we use linear algebra, use ideas from linear algebra to model real systems in which uh, the basis is not um, something that looks like a list of numbers. For example, if you think about a, what you may learn about later, a Fourier transform, that's a method for writing a wave, say like a sound wave, my voice, or any other sound wave in terms of a basis of simple functions like sine waves or cosines, right? Um, and that can be used to synthesize sound or to you know, equalize. If you have an equalizer that you use to adjust you know, the base turn, you turn up the base. There's a Fourier transform happening somewhere in the background that makes that possible. Um, similarly, uh, if you do something like analyze images or analyze genes, um, you'll get a basis of things which don't necessarily look like numbers, though somewhere under the, under the hood they are, but you might see a basis of the space of images that consists of things like edges sitting inside of space. Or if you're thinking about something like faces, you might get like fragments of a face or something that looks vaguely face-like, and those get combined linearly to form something which is recognizable. Um, so it's good to think about these things in the abstract. So at this point, um, We've made some progress, but there are still things we don't understand. Um, one of those things is kind of the role of uniqueness. More concretely, we defined a basis to be something which is both uh, an independent list of vectors and a spanning list. Um, and one of the things that we'll address today is the questions, can a spanning list be reduced or shrunk? to a basis. So a spanning list is you know, enough to write every element of the vector space, but it might be redundant. Right? For example, if I have the vector space of the blackboard, you know, here's a spanning list, but it's kind of terrible in the sense that it uses far too many vectors. And we'd like kind of an algorithm or proof that says that we can always get rid of some of these to be left with a basis for the space. <coughs> and similarly, can a, a, a linearly independent list be extended? So if we start with some large vector space and some, a few vectors inside that are independent, but don't give, a, give you everything in the vector space, can we add more vectors in some kind of a systematic way so as to obtain a basis? And finally, you know, at the end of today, we'll talk about what is a dimension? How do we define the dimension of a vector space? And why it's a good notion of size. First of all, recall that a list of vectors is linearly independent 
if whenever I can write 0 as a linear combination of these vectors, all the coefficients are equal to 0. That's linear, the definition of linear independence. And a basis is a list of vectors in the vector space. Let's say a basis for v is a list of vectors in v. That is literally independent. And spans v. Spans v means that every vector in v can be written as a linear combination. And linearly ind linear independence means that. <clears throat> so the last thing I said last time was the following proposition about uniqueness, a list of vectors. in our vector space V is a basis if and only if right. IFF for if and only if every vector V in the vector space can be written. So the can be written part says that it's a spanning list. And the uniquely part is what's going to enforce independence. <coughs> uniquely in the form v equals a1, v1, etc., up to am, vm. So there's a unique choice of coefficients such that the linear combination that they define is equal to a vector. And this part corresponds to span, and the uniquely corresponds to the linear independence condition. That's a theorem that has an easy proof, because it's almost a rephrasing of the definition. So it's an if and only if, right, if and only if, the symbol for that is an error that goes in both directions. So this direction of the if and only if, we start by supposing v1 up to vm is a basis. I'm going to start introducing sometimes notation for lists, just abbreviating a list by, by a letter, because we'll be writing so many of these lists that it'll be handy as we go on. So suppose this is a basis by definition of basis, the span of this list is equal to the vector space. And every vector has an expression v equals some sum linear combination of field element weighted vectors from the basis. <coughs> That's the it can be written part. And for the uniqueness, of course, we want to suppose that we have some other linear combination which equals v. v1, v1 to vm, vm is another linear combination expression for our given vector v. Well, of course, now we're going to subtract, right? So then 0 can be obtained by subtracting v from itself. And I can subtract these two representations from each other, distribute am minus bm vm. And this is an expression for 0. Right? 
But since this is a basis, its other properties besides being spanning, besides being able to write every vector this way, is that the vectors, list of vectors v1 up to vm, are linearly independent. And so since we've written an expression for 0, it implies that all of the coefficients are 0. So all of these are 0. And so in fact, these expressions were the same. So this expression was unique. And in the other direction, we suppose that each v in the vector space can be written, so has an expression, and that expression is unique, can be written uniquely. Well, the can be written part says that The vector space is equal to the span. And so what we want to show is that the elements of the list are linearly dependent, linearly independent, independent. Nearly independent. OK, but we assumed that each vector could be written uniquely. Linear independence is all about expressions for 0. So let's write an expression for 0. Well, the easiest expression for 0 is 0 times everything. Set all the coefficients to be 0. That's a perfectly good expression for 0. But we assumed that it was unique. So in fact, it's the only expression for 0. In other words, if that was another expression for 0, all of these ai's would have to be equal to 0 in the field, because this was the unique expression for the 0 vector. OK, that's why that's true. So let's talk now about redundancy. Suppose I give you a spanning list. Can you reduce it to be a basis? You can. Let's call this the reduce to basis theorem. And that says, given a spanning list, vector space of a vector space, so a list that spans a vector space, finite dimensional, by our definition of spanning list, um, can be reduced to a basis of the vector space. By reduced, I mean, throw stuff out. Kill vectors. Get rid of vectors. So that should make you think of a linear dependence lemma, a scapegoat lemma. Of course, we'll use that to do this, right? OK, so suppose I have a spanning list for v, v1 up to vn. First of all, let's get rid of any v's which are equal to 0 vector, because they don't add anything to our ability to write things, and they're dependent on everything. So let's get rid of those. And let's go through our list in order. And this is sort of one of the reasons that we're using lists instead of sets, because everything comes with its own order. And that just makes some arguments more convenient. You have to pick an order and check that it's OK and all that. So, OK, so let's go through this list in order. <coughs> v1, v2, and so on. 
up to say vj minus 1. And then we look at the next entry in the list, the next vector. And if vj is in the span of the vectors that came before it, v1 up to vj minus 1, which remember I'll write v sub less than j. If it's in the span of that, just delete it. Because it's in the span, we didn't change the span. of the entire list by making this deletion. And since at every point, at every step here, no vector vk is in the span of the vectors that came before it, right? because if it was, we threw it out. So. So the remaining list is linearly independent by the linear dependence lemma or scapegoat lemma because that lemma said that if it wasn't, there exists such a vector. There exists such a vector that's dependent on the others and which is in the span of all the vectors that came before it. So that can't be true of any of these, so therefore by the counterpositive of this linear dependence lemma, and this is an independent list. Nothing can be thrown away. That has some immediate results. One small immediate result is that every finite dimensional, finite dimensional vector space has a basis. And now the proof of that is very short. By definition, finite dimensional means it has a finite spanning list. Now we reduce to a basis. And at this point, I want to just make an observation, make a note to remind you that this vector space, the zero vector space, is finite dimensional. We need to assign it a basis. We said already that the span of the empty list is this space. And so this thing is going to have basis as basis, the empty list. You can think of that as a convention or sort of the thing that to do to make the empty products and the empty sums and things like that work out. We call it a convention that that has, has the empty list. OK, so in the other direction, so a basis is something which is both a spanning list and linearly independent list. So in the other direction, we want to start with a big vector space. So we have some list of independent vectors inside of it. We want to extend it until we get a basis. So that's an also extremely useful thing to be able to do. Let's the extend to basis theorem. And this theorem says, well, every linearly independent list of vectors in a finite dimensional vector space can be extended. a basis. 
of that vector space. Give the proof of that. So we want to start with a linearly independent list. So suppose I have a linearly independent list, v1 up to vm inside of v. v is finite dimensional. So v has a spanning list. By definition of finite dimensional, let's call it W1 up to Wn. So we just go through this list. The idea is we just go through this list of vectors, add what we need to, throw away what we don't. All right, so if W1 is in the span of V1 up to Vm, Let's set our first take on the basis, our first attempt at the basis, to be just the list that we started with, v1 up to vm. Because we don't need w1. If w1 is not in the span, well, we need to add it. So then set v1 to be v1 up to vm, and then w1 not in the span, so we're sure that this is still independent by the linear dependence lemma, right? And we just continue that process. You know, say we've done this j minus 1 times. We ask, is wj in the span of the basis at the previous step? If it is, do nothing. If it's not in the span, then let our new basis B sub J be B J minus 1 adjoining W J. Right, so we just test each element in the spanning list. If it's in there already, we throw it away. If it's a new thing, we add it. Because at each stage, it's um, linear. It's at each stage, the vec no vector is contained in the span of the vectors that came before it. So by the linear dependence lemma, the list is linearly independent. So at the end, v is the span of the final basis that we get after doing going through the, all the spanning list. Uh, and Vn is linearly independent, and so it's a basis. So let's use those two propositions for something. Suppose I have a finite dimensional vector space V, and it has a subspace U. Then there exists another subspace W. Such that v 
is the direct sum of u and w, okay. some kind of complement to it. For the proof, OK, so V is finite dimensional. We had a theorem last week that said that U, if it was a subspace of a finite dimensional space, is also finite dimensional. So in particular, <coughs> U has a basis. Because every finite dimensional space has a basis, as we proved earlier today. And by this extend theorem, we can, we can extend the basis of U to a basis of V, U1 up to UM, and then some additional vectors W1 up to WN. Well, now we have an obvious choice for the definition of W which is just the span of the new stuff we added. And we just need to check now that it's a direct sum. So remember we had a criterion for a direct sum of two subspaces like this. In the case that there are only two, and there were two parts to this criterion, we want that every element of V can be written as a sum of something in U and something in W. And in lieu of the, the usual condition about 0, we can just check to see whether the intersection of u and w is the 0 vector space. If those two things hold, then v is the direct sum of u and w. Let's check those two things. Okay, so this is a this is a this here is a basis of the entire space V. So every element of V has an expression which is a linear combination of all of these m plus n elements, which we can write as sum from i equals one up to m, a i u i, plus the rest of the list, j equals one up to n, v j wj, and well, we've just written this v as a sum of something in u and something in w. Okay, so it's the first part holds. And for the second part, suppose I'm given a vector v, which is in the intersection, u intersect w. It's in u, so I can write it like this. It's a sum from i equals 1 up to m of some ai ui. And it's also in w, so it's a sum from j equals 1 up to n of some bj wj. So two expressions for some suitable coefficients, ai and bj. So we can subtract v minus v, 0 equals v minus v, and that's going to be 0 equals v minus v is this expression, sum of the ai ui minus sum of the bj wj, and that's an expression for 0. But this was a basis, and particularly, in particular, it was linearly independent. And so it must be that all the coefficients here are 0. And since all the coefficients are 0, it must be that v itself is 0, the 0 vector. Okay. So that proves that anything which is in this intersection must be 0, so the intersection is the 0 vector space. 
now we're ready to talk about dimension. So, so far we know how to define finite dimensional and infinite dimensional, but not n dimensional. And there are some properties that we'd like dimension to have. Um, one of these properties I would call, I would say, is that we'd like dimension to be some kind of a sensible notion of size. So, here are two sensible notions of size. Suppose I have a set A and a set B. And I'm interested in, say, the area or the volume of them. There's a formula which says that the area of the union of A and B is equal to the area of A plus the area of B minus the area of the intersection. Right? The same is true if I have some finite sets. Right? A has three things. If I, and I say this about cardinality, the cardinality of the set A union B, where now I'm thinking of A and B as these finite sets of points, is equal to the cardinality of A, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, plus the cardinality of B, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, minus the cardinality of the intersection, which is 2. So let's hope 5 plus 6 minus 2 is 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Right. We'd like it to be something like that. And we'd like to mention to, to do something like that, except there's this special situation, right, that union is not quite what we want. Right? Union is not the right notion of combining vector spaces. Instead, we have this idea of addition of vector spaces. So we're going to have to show something like this works for, for union. What else do we expect dimension to do? Well, we have this familiar vector space, Rn lists of numbers, and we'd sure like the dimension of that to be n. Okay. Hopefully we can do these things at the same time. And it should probably also have some connection to the length of a basis. Right? Seems like the length of a basis should be equal to the dimension. So let's prove that it's possible to do all those things. In order to make the definition, the first thing I need is the following simple theorem. <coughs> any two bases, so any two things which are a list of vectors, which are independent and spanning, <coughs> any two bases of a finite dimensional <coughs> vector space have the same length. The proof of that is quite easy if B1 and B2 are each a basis for V. That means they're linearly independent and they're spanning sets. But remember we had a theorem that said that the length of a linearly independent list is upper bounded by the length of any spanning set. Right? So that tells you that the length of B1 as a linearly independent list is at most the length of B2, because that's a spanning set. And of course, the same thing is true if I change the indices. Okay. So the lengths are equal. Great, so all the bases, transitivity of equality, have the same length. This is going to work. And that means we can make a definition that we want. The dimension 
finite dimensional. And so this isn't nonsense because we have a definition of finite dimensional, which is just that there exists a finite spanning list. You know, it's, we, the, definition, the definition of the dimension, the dimension of a finite dimensional vector space. Just the length of any basis for the vector space. And we know that those are all equal because of this theorem. Great. So that tells us another one of our desiderata is true, which is that if I have f to the n, I can always write a basis for that which is just I put a 1 or something non-zero in the first position, say it's 4. And then I try a 1 in the second position, <coughs> third position. So this is the basis that you learn about the first time you see a matrix or a vector. Right. That's a basis. It has n elements, so it is the dimension. Okay, okay so that's good. So we've achieved that desiderata as well. F to the n equals n. So about our other one, so this idea that we'd like, we'd like it to be a good kind of size, a good notion of size. We'd like for this inclusion-exclusion principle to hold, where we sum up everything and we subtract the overlap. Good news, it holds, but that requires some proof. So the theorem says, suppose u1 and u2 are subspaces of a finite dimensional vector space then the size formula has to use the right notion of combin combination which here for us is the addition of subspaces the smallest vector space containing the union of u1 and u2 its size its dimension <coughs> has to be equal to the dimension of u1 plus the dimension of u2 minus the dimension of, and here, we can use the intersection because the intersection of two vector spaces, as you've proved, is a vector space. So our formula, or our modified formula for size that's analogous to the way we measure the size of a set or an area, works. And for the proof, the proof is a little bit long. So I'm going to do that on the next time we meet. I'm going to leave a little bit of time for you to hand in your homework. You need to check that you did it. And everything.